Okay, good morning everyone, and uh, welcome back to another week in the Tehillim class. We're holding in the middle of Samechei, which is 65, and we are in Pasig Vav, the sixth verse. And just to remind ourselves of what we were speaking about last week, we left off in the idea of Tefillah, where we are... Oh, come on in. Now we have live also. Okay, <clears throat> uh, and we we're speaking. Uh, we're speaking about when Samechei number sixty-five, and we are in the sixth verse. And we spoke about last week this idea, the power of feel the power of our prayers, and that even if a person, for example, maybe doesn't have the schusim, they don't have the merits in and of themselves that their tefillah should be heard, that HaKadosh Baruch is going to pay a heed to them and pay attention. We mentioned a fascinating idea that the tefillahs that a person says is like the koshering mechanism that you would use for a pot, for a pan, that has trefus, that has something not kosher inside. That just as if a person had a pot that cooked inside of there, let's say meat and milk, and that pot no longer is kosher, you have to kosher it, boiling water and the like, and it pulls out all of the impurities that are absorbed in the walls, and it makes it kosher once again. The words of our tefillah is when it goes through our lips, assuming that our lips have not said always the greatest things in the world, the prayers themselves are the kashring agents of our lips, purifying ourselves and allowing our words then to go into the heavens and ascend. And therefore, we should not take lightly at all the power that HaKadosh Baruch Hu invested us with, and we should not overlook the abilities that we have with our prayers to actually change the destiny of our lives, to change the ways that things are going with ourselves and with others. Prayer is something that is always going to come to a person in their time of need, if you're going to pray and use your words in the right way. So we left off on number six, and verse six says, Neirois b'tzedek ta'aneinu elokai. It says that you answer us with awesome truths and righteousness. Elokai yishenu, our God of salvation. You answer us with truths and righteousness, and you are our God of salvation. Miftach kolkatsve eretz, you are the trust of all men who dwell in the land, the yam rechaykim, and even those that are on distant seas that are far away. So HaKadosh Baruch answers us with tzedek, with, with, with righteous, righteousness and truth, and He is our salvation, He's the God of salvation, and it means that men all over the world, in every far-flung corner that there might possibly be, HaKadosh Baruch Hu is the one that we can trust upon and rely upon. Now remember we mentioned in the introduction to this Tehillim that David HaMelech is also speaking about Yemais Mashiach, when Mashiach will come. And when Mashiach will come, the world will look very different. It will be a world in which every single person, man, woman, child, Jew, non-Jew alike, whoever is left at that time in history, they will all recognize HaKadosh Baruch as being the supreme force of the universe. And they will know that HaKadosh Baruch is the one that is running the world and, and guiding the world. And therefore, everybody will come to rely upon Hashem, which is what we are waiting for. When you live in a world, or as we live in such a world, when we live in a world where everybody is really relying upon themselves, relying upon what they learned from the news outlets, relying upon the books that they read, from the videos that they watch, when they're relying upon the promises or the empty promises of our politicians, relying upon the crude ideas of others that are in this world that are saying over the wrong things, trying to convince us that they are the right things. So then the, the presence of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, unfortunately, is very hidden in this world. And when Hashem's presence is hidden, it's very hard to be able to make that connection that we need to make. However, when that time will come, when there will be Mashiach, when that time will come, where HaKadosh Baruch Hu has what's called Gilu Ipanim, where He reveals Himself completely, not only are the Jewish people then going to be the benefactors 
or the beneficiaries of being able to recognize Hashem and follow HaKadosh Baruch and cling to Him, the entire world, from one side to the other, up and down, anywhere where you'll find a human being, once that HaKadosh Baruch is Megala, that He reveals Himself, the whole world will be able to take will be able to partake of his presence and his essence. And therefore, Rav Hirsch writes over here the following idea. We're coming off the, the verse that is speaking about tefillah, about our prayers. And if we will come with such an honest and a sincere tefillah to you, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, then we know that our prayer is that one day all of mankind will address you, and we know that you will fulfill our desire under this condition. And that condition is to answer our prayer from the sanctuary of your law, which means that if we in fact are going to follow in the ways of your mitzvahs, you have to have a schus, you have to have a merit that Hashem is going to listen to you. It doesn't just work that, you know, a person prays to God and then Hashem is going to listen. You have to have merits. You have to have something that is going to find favor in the eyes of Hashem. Like we have in last week's parsha. If you go in the statutes of Hashem, and mitzvahs of Tishmur, you will guard his mitzvahs, and you will keep everything that Hashem says, and you will follow in his way, so on and so forth. Then says HaKadosh Baruch, I will bring you great reward. I'll take care of all your needs in this world. I'll take care of all your rain in this world. I'll take care of all your animals. Your enemies will stay away from you in this world. Everything will be taken care of. You'll have plenty of time to be able to serve me, says HaKadosh Baruch but that's only in if you will do your job. It's a two-way street, says HaKadosh Baruch Hu. There's what I'm asking of you and what you're asking of me. If you want to come to HaKadosh Baruch Hu with the audacity to ask Hashem for something, it must mean that you have to come with a, something in your back pocket over here that you can present to HaKadosh Baruch Hu and say, I deserve to ask you because... I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing. Now, it doesn't mean that HaKadosh Baruch needs to see that everybody is the biggest tzaddikim in the world, and that we're all keeping every single mitzvah with total perfection, and we are aligned with the ruts and the will of Hashem in all of our endeavors, and we never waver, and we never falter, and we never have any doubts in our mind about what we should do and what we shouldn't do. Everything is always clear. HaKadosh Baruch understands who we are, he understands where we are. He understands what is the nature of each and every one of us, what we are capable of, what we are not capable of at this particular juncture in our life. The koicha is the inner potential that Hashem has given to each of us, where we could push and we could stretch ourselves to be able to do more than we are doing right now. And HaKadosh Baruch Hu, David HaMelech is saying over here, that HaKadosh Baruch Hu, if we come to you with these prayers, where we are paying tribute to, we're recognizing you, we understand that you are the Elo, you are the Elokei Yishenu, you are the God of our salvation. We don't put our salvation elsewhere in other things, we put our salvation, our trust in you, Hashem. So then we are asking you that in the schos, in the merits of our tefillahs, which is filled with our amuna, filled with our bitachin, we trust in you, HaKadosh Baruch we don't trust in anybody else, so then you should answer us. You should answer us, you should answer us in righteousness and in truth. Because that we ourselves are trying to align all of our affairs in, your, in what you would want, HaKadosh Baruch Hu. That we are trying to go in the pathways of tzidkos, of righteousness. We want to be better people. We want to do what you want us to do. So therefore, if we will keep, im, if, that's what it says in the Bible, if, if you'll do what HaKadosh Baruch Hu says, then all the brachas will come. But, like the Pasha says, the im loy, and if you don't, there's always the other side of the coin. If you don't, and you end up straying off over here and doing this, so then HaKadosh Baruch Hu says, how can I reward you? How can I give you the blessings that you're asking for? How can I shower your life with all of the hashpa, all of the divine influence that I want to give to the world? Meaning HaKadosh Baruch Hu wants to give to the world. He wants to shower us with goodness and blessing. Hashem is not interested in making our lives miserable. There's only two parshas in the whole Torah that speak about the misery that HaKadosh Baruch is going to bring upon the Jewish people. There's two times when there are klalois, when there are curses and the rebuke that Hashem says. The rest of the Torah is not filled with that. It's true, there's challenges, 
And it's true that sometimes we see that people get punished, and we see that we end up maybe losing our merits to go into the land of Eretz Yisrael right away. All that's true. But that there's so many punishments, one after the other after the other, it only happens twice in the Torah. And when you get to that point, HaKadosh Baruch is saying, the basket has been filled with all of the sins of Klal Yisrael. I cannot hold back my wrath anymore at this point, because I have to straighten you out. Whenever the punishments are coming to the Jewish people, it's all because Hashem wants to straighten us out and cleanse us and absolve us from the things that we have done wrong. So here we are asking HaKadosh Baruch Hu that we'll try our best to do what is right in your eyes. We will live a life of tzedek, of righteousness, a life of truth, a life where we are trying to align ourselves as much as we can with your will. And in the schos, in the merit of that, what is your response going to be? The response is going to be that you will be megala, you will reveal yourself, not just to us, but you need to reveal yourself to the world because it's the world that is around us that is making our lives so difficult as a, a verified member of Klal Yisrael that is willing to serve you under all circumstances. Because that we live in a world where there's so much background noise and there's so many people that are saying things that are against HaKadosh Baruch and against this Torah, you think that it doesn't have an effect on us? You think that when you're driving in the car and you're listening to the news and you hear the way that they're presenting their, their, their picture of their, their understanding and their impression of what's going on in the world, you think that it doesn't have an effect on us? Of course it does. Just like Chazal tell us, if a person walks into a perfume store, even if they buy nothing, when they walk out, they smell very good. They have the fragrance of the perfume all over them. If a person walks into a tannery, which is known to be a very putrid smell, it has formaldehyde and all different chemicals, and it reeks in that place, even if you don't lift a finger, you don't touch anything, you don't walk out with a hide on your shoulders, you will also have a stench about you. Because you went into a place where it did not smell good, and it clings to the clothing, it clings to the person. Right? When we had COVID, and the world was going crazy with everything, and we were told you have to wear gloves everywhere because everything has germs. Everything has germs. And when I would go to get gas in my car, my wife would not let me back into the house until I would show her that I was scrubbing my hands with all of the, uh, the Purell and, and, and the sanitizers. And sometimes that wasn't good enough. I had to go and I had to wash my hands. And if that wasn't good enough, she felt maybe I did too much outside of the house, I had to change my clothes. Why? Because we were living in a time where everybody was frightened. There's germs everywhere. And if you catch the wrong germ, it will go on to you. You'll bring it into the house. You'll affect the entire family. And that was an invisible germ. Nobody could even see it. Infinitesimal amounts of the germ was there in the air. They said that you, you could fit, like I remember what it was, in, in a teaspoon. Billions and billions and billions and billions of these germs of the, of the coronavirus was in a teaspoon. So then we live in a world where the world is making noise, the world is saying things, it's doing things to us, and it's telling, and we're going to think that it's not going to have an effect on us at all. It's not going to change the way that we think, or the way that we look at the world, or we look at ourselves, or we look at Yiddish guys. You know, with all the technology that is out there in the world, one of the things that we try to teach to the children, and this is what the message that they give over in the schools is, if you in fact allow yourself to watch these things that are really inappropriate for you, you have to know the power of imagery. You have to know the power of seeing things with your own eyes. The eyes, as Chazal tells us, are the chaloinais, they are the windows to the neshama. The, 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 the al Sheikh I believe, is the one who writes that the tselem elokim, the godliness of a person, can be seen on his face. That means that, and the eyes, which are the, the outlet, it's the way that the neshama views this world and brings the world back in, the eyes are what is going to allow us to interact with our tselem elokim. If your eyes see something in this world that is inappropriate, whether it is on the streets 
or even worse probably on that device that's in your hand or the screen that's in front of you. You have to know what that is doing to the Tzalem Elohim, to the godliness of the person. You have to know what it's doing inside the brain, inside your mind. The mind itself, it says that this is where the neshama is dwelling. It's, it's resting somewhere over here on the mayach, on the head, on the brain. So when you take in these things, do you think it doesn't have an effect? Do you think it doesn't hurt? Do you think it doesn't disturb the serenity of the neshama that is only looking for kedusha and tahara and pure things and godliness? Of course it disturbs. And of course it creates friction inside of you. But worse, maybe worse than that is what we like to tell over to the, to the young adults of this world. It skews your vision of what reality really is. When you go and you watch one of these ridiculous movies that are out there in the world today that are dealing with relationships between men and women, and you're watching the love of Hollywood, and you're watching the lust of Hollywood, and you're watching the way they treat each other, the way they talk to each other, and the jealousy, all the different things that are going on over there. And then if Khalil of Echas, it's a, one, of those, one of those movies that gets a little bit too provocative, it's destroying the way that you will think about what love between a man and a woman really is. It defiles it, and it demeans it, and it, when you see it, it's so powerful, you can't take it out of your brain. You can't. Like the famous story that I've told many times in these classes, and that is the, the Rosh Hashiva in Eretz Yisrael that was a Baal Tshuva, and he'd been from for, I don't know, 25, 30 years. He was, an, he, I think I know who the person is, massive Talmud Chachem, Torah scholar, running a yeshiva, being mechazic people, elevating people, a genius, Sheba genius, the way that he understands Talmud and Hashkafa and everything. And he was once standing by a bus stop in Yushalayim, and anybody that knows how it works in Jerusalem, that usually there's many stores behind the bus stops, and in those stores there's very often speakers that are facing out towards the store, playing their music, trying to attract the attention that people will come in to their store. So this Rosh Hashiva is standing by the bus stop, and there's a store behind him playing its music, its old classic rock from the 1960s. And the Rosh Hashiva is waiting for the bus, and he's standing there, not really paying attention to the fact that there's classic rock and roll behind him. And the next thing he sees, his foot is tapping along with the beat of that song that he remembers from his golden eras of, this, of the 60s when he was just a, some hippie in America. And he panics. How could it be? I'm from for so many years and my foot is tapping along with this old beat from so many years ago? How could it be? He jumps on the bus and he, instead of going where he was supposed to go, he takes a bus and he goes to Matersdorf, which was the home and the residence of the great Sadik, the Godel Adur at that time, one of the Godel Adur of Scheinberg, Zeich Sadik Nivracha, the one who wore all the tzitzes, tefillin all day long. And he comes to Rav Scheinberg and he says, Rebbe, what am I going to do? I thought of a Rosh Hashiva. I thought that I'm 30 years already not in this world. And I'm tapping my foot to the music. What am I going to do? So Rav Scheinberg told him the famous story. And that story is that when he was a young boy, he was known as Lefty Scheinberg. He used to play stickball on the street all the time, and he was an avid, an avid uh, baseball fan. I guess at the time it was the Brooklyn Dodgers or the or the New York the, the Yankees. I think the Yankees. He was a big Yankees fan, and here he is today. He's the Godelador. He sits in Talis and Tefillin all day long. He davens nates every day. He has all the Torahs on his fingertips. In, in the world of the revealed Torah and the Nister and the Kabbalah, he was a giant. The Nister, he was a giant. So he said that years ago, he went to America on a fundraising trip, and he was staying in somebody's house while he was there. And as he's walking down the hall, he glances at the coffee table, and the Daily Times is on the table, and it says on the top, Yankees lose the pennant which means they lost the World Series game. And he said, I went, ah, Rav Scheinberg. He went, ah. And he said he was in shock with himself. But he said he learned a very valuable lesson. 
you can take your head out of the baseball, but you cannot take the baseball out of your head. Years later, and this, this, uh, this incident upset Rav Scheinberg. He thought that he advanced more than that. So he worked and he worked and he worked to get it out of his head. Years later, he was back in America on a fundraising trip. He was in the house. He walks past the coffee table. He sees the, he sees the thing. The Yankees win the pennant. And he didn't even get excited. And he was so excited that he didn't get excited that when he went back to Eretz he made a kiddish in honor of the fact that he'd worked baseball out of his head so much that it didn't bother him, it didn't mean anything to him anymore. So we live in a world where there is so much imagery and there's so much noise and we're being bombarded all day long. The more that we expose ourselves to it, the more it goes in. And then you can try to take your head out of it. You come to shul and you want to daven. So you take your head out of all the things that you were watching on Friday or Thursday, then you come to Shulam Shabbos, but you can't take it out of your head. Then you're sitting there, davening is beautiful, and your mind is out the windows, someplace else. My, um, my parents used to come for, for Rosh Hashanah when we lived in Yeshiva Lane in Baltimore, and my father used to tell me the first day of Rosh Hashanah was very hard because he was coming out of L.A., coming from work, coming from business, coming from everything. It took him one 24 hours just to calm his, his head down. The second day of Rosh Hashanah, he said, was always the best, because he was already, his mind was clear. You can take your head out of the baseball, but you cannot take the baseball out of your head. Says, says David HaMelech over here, Kodesh Baruch, we'll try our best. We're going to go in the ways that you're asking us to go in. We're going to try to do what you want us to do. We'll live a life of tzidkos of righteousness. We know that we are fallible. We'll make mistakes. We're not going to be perfect. We know that. But at the end of the day, what's the bracha that we're asking for? Elekei Yishenu, you must save us from the mess that the world is in so that everybody will recognize that you are the one and the only Rebbein Shalom. And once we recognize that, everybody will stop doing the things that they're doing that are going against you, Hashem. There won't be TikTok anymore in the world once that HaKadosh Baruch reveals himself. There won't be movies once HaKadosh Baruch reveals himself. There won't be crazy music that somehow became the, the, the religious genre as well. The music that's out there today that Jewish people are listening to. You know, it used to be like we were worried our kids are going to listen to Goyish music. What's the difference today? It's all the same. I happen to think sometimes I hear some of the, the music in the stores actually has a better message than what the, what's going on with this rap beats and the techno and all these things. It's crazy where we're living right now. It's times that we never dreamed of going. In the olden days, the Hasidim, they used to leave the Shtetlach and they used to go out into the with the world a little bit, and they used to try to get music to bring back to the Rebbe. And they would hear these marches of pomp and circumstance, and they would hear these, these inspiring tunes. Then they'd bring it back to the Rebbe, and the Rebbe would decide if he could kosher the niggin or not. If he felt that there was some kedusha to the niggin, he would kosher it, and he would add in Jewish words, and it would become a... It would become a niggin that they would sing by the tish, by the Rebbe's tish Friday night, and then it was elevated. And if he held that, they couldn't kosher it. There was too much of the impurity that was in there. He said, no, that's not a song for us. Today, everything goes. Techno? Techno, when I was a kid, techno was like the worst music in the world. In the clubs, people were taking, I don't know, ecstasy. There were dark, dark lights. They were bouncing up and down. In the... Now it's like, David HaMelech, David HaMelech is being sung to techno music. Rap is for gangsters. Now it's for Jews. It's for religious Jews. And if you don't have a rap song on your latest album, no one's going to buy your album. If you don't have techno Israeli music on your latest album, who's going to listen to your music? You won't be famous anymore. This is all the product of our generations. It's all the product of getting everything going on over here. And so we're asking our Kodesh Baruch Hu, We'll do our best. We're under tremendous pressure, Hashem. It is not easy to be a fully Ehrlich, Frum, Yid in the world today that is above all of the things that are going on because we see it everywhere that we go. And even in the Frum circles, it comes in. It's all schlepped in. It's seeped in to everything that we have. The fact that there's so many videos 
when was there ever so many videos for the Jewish people? And it's like a big thing, or they made this video and this video. So we just put our kids in front of the tube over there, in front of the computer, and we said, go ahead, it's okay, it's Jewish, you can watch, no problem. <laughs> Is it really so good for kids to watch movies? Is it so good for them to learn Torah from a screen? What happens when they have to go to school and they have to learn, and they have to learn from a, a black and white Gemara? Whoa, I was home, I was watching all these color things and things were popping out, there was music and emotions. Now I have to learn the Gemara, the Gemara could be so boring. Black, it's white, it's complicated, it's complex, there's details, you don't understand the language, you don't understand what they're saying, you have to go back and forth, back and forth. I like the movies better. So what are we teaching our kids? What are we teaching them? I remember when I was, years ago, when we still lived in Baltimore, and we were coming back for a Bein Azmanim for a summer vacation, and I asked my Rosh Hashira Feldman, I said, you know, when we go back to L.A., so there's, you know, there's screens in the house. Like, what do you still do? We can't, my kids can't watch anything? Like, it drives them crazy if we say you can't watch anything. So he told me, you know, it's only for the summer, a few weeks that you're there. He said, only Jewish things, and it can't be for a long, long periods of time. He says, but do me a favor, please. Do not let your kids watch Disney. I said, why not? He says, it's too fascinating to the child's mind. The colors and the music and the scenes and everything moving so, so fast like this. He says, after they see that, how are they going to come back to school and see the beauty in learning an Aleph and a base? How are they going to see the beauty in learning the Parsha when it's just the teacher telling over the story and there's no image in it? How are they going to do that? He says, do me a favor, please. You want to let them watch Uncle Maishri? Fine. You want to let them watch this? Fine. Just don't let them watch Disney. Because it'll just, it'll just twist up their mind. And he said also one other thing. If you're going to do like, you want them to have like learning things on the computer, he said, don't let them learn how to read off the computer. He says, because if the, on the computer, the flashing colors and the flashing images and the, the sounds and there's noise, A, B, C, all the different things, what happens when they go back to school and it's just a book? It's so boring. And they can't look at school as being boring. Okay, this is ancient days, you know, everything is, everything is on the, even in the schools now. I don't understand this. Even in the schools, they have screens. They're teaching our children Gemara on the screen. They're teaching our children the Chumash on the screen. They're showing, bringing in videos over here, music over here. I don't know. This is a different world that we're living in. We didn't, we didn't see this 20 years ago. But that's all the pressure of the world that is seeping in. Because if you know that many, that majority of the Frum kids are anyway on screens, anyway they're watching stuff, anyway they're exposed to this stuff, we, gotta, we have to capture them in the classroom. So if the Rebbe's not exciting enough by himself, even if he's the greatest storyteller in the world, he's not exciting enough. They need screen time in school. Does that make any sense? No, but that's what is going on in the world today. And that's what our kids are having because that's what's considered normal because that's what the world is saying. So we're davening to HaKadosh Baruch It's a good thing there's not so many people here otherwise I'll probably get myself in big trouble for saying such things. But Lemaisa HaKadosh Baruch is telling, or the Davening Malach is saying, Rebbeinu She'olam, we'll try our best. But part of the problem is that we can't succeed is because we live in a crazy world. And they're building up the pressure every single day, all the time. So you be our Yoshia, you be our salvation. And you make it that you reveal yourself in such a way that every human being in this world will come to trust in you. Everybody will realize that the world revolves around you. Not that we want you to revolve around us, HaKadosh Baruch, we want the world to revolve around ourselves. And once that we begin to look at it, and once, we, once you do that, Hashem, so then all of mankind will recognize that you, in fact, are the God of salvation. And the way that you want the world to run is B'tzedek, with righteousness. And therefore, everybody will try to come under that umbrella of tzedek, of righteousness, and serve you in the way that you would like us to serve you. And this he says over here, it says in the Pasuk, it says, Kol Eretz, to all the ends of the earth, v'yom rechaykim, and all the far off seas. So he says, what's this, it's like a double line, all the ends of the earth, all the far off seas. How many people we're talking about over here? Says Rav Hirsch, 
that Yam Rechoikim, the far off seas. So he says there's like a new world, and there is an old there is an old world, and he says that the ends of the earth are enumerated over here to emphasize that there's only one God, and there's one right, and there's one sacred way that a person should end up living their life, and that's that every man on earth, every man, woman, child on earth, no matter what your background, your religion, your race, your creed, everybody should be living a life where we recognize that HaKadosh Baruch Hu, you are the one, you are the master of the universe, you are the one that, is, that we are supposed to be subservient to. And, it's, and he writes over here that it, it doesn't matter the differences, all of mankind forms one single whole in accordance with its moral destiny and the salvation that can be attained if this destiny is fulfilled. The world is supposed to function in complete symmetry. The world is supposed to run perfectly. We're not supposed to see wars. We're not supposed to see tornadoes. We're not supposed to see the the, uh, the 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 ozone layer falling apart and the the climate control we're not supposed to see all these things there shouldn't be people poor that are in the streets sleeping in tents thousands and thousands and thousands of people sleeping in tents with their children having no place to go we're not supposed to see that we're not supposed to see sickness there shouldn't be wildness there shouldn't be violence there shouldn't be people walking into schools and uh, malls killing people we shouldn't see such things but that's when you live in a world that's out of out of sorts. When you live in a world where no one is unified, where nobody is working together because we're not under the umbrella of HaKadosh Baruch then you have a world that's literally out of control. But the, the, the tefillah, the ask that David HaMelech is saying over here is that we want that we get to a place in history, in the, in, in the very, very present future that we are in, we want that everything is made right, HaKadosh Baruch and the way that it's made right is when you will reveal yourself so that we should all turn our eyes and our hearts and our souls and our tefillahs and our prayers towards you. Because that is when every person in the world will be living a reality which is really one in the same. And that is the recognition that you are Kodesh Baruch Hu, the one and only God of the universe. If there's many gods that are out there, if there's many things that people will give tribute to and, and put their faith in and their belief in, so then the world just becomes the mess that it's in. I was thinking when I was preparing that you would have thought that after such a experience that happened in the world like COVID, where the world is, the whole universe was brought to its knees and standstill. Now at the time, that's how we were all thinking. Everybody was beginning to recognize there's a Rebbein Shalom because look what he did. He shut down the entire world. It wasn't China. China didn't shut down the entire world. HaKadosh Baruch Hu shut down the world with an invisible plague. Okay? In Mitzrayim, there were plagues that were going on. Throughout Tanakh, you see different magifas, different plagues that there were. This was the invisible plague that killed millions of people across the world. Rahman Litzan. Brought economy to a standstill. Schooling stopped. Shuls closed. Stores closed. There's people that could not pick themselves back up afterwards. How you drive down the boulevard, you drive through the city, you see how many countless storefronts are empty with boards on them or for lease, for rent, because closed. People lost their business. They lost their livelihood. People out on the streets now because of all of this. We came to a place where there was a standstill in humanity and society. And everybody had to recognize that Kodesh Baruch runs the world. And we all said, look how powerful Hashem is. Look what He's able to do. I remember it was like in January that year was the, the president gives his State of the Union address. And Trump was president of that. And he was, wow, he was pumping himself up so good in that State of the Union address how much he accomplished and how much he did and the economy has never been stronger and our country has never been safer and the borders are closed off and, and production productivity is up like never before and jobs, nobody's losing their jobs anymore and we have more people working than ever before and the food and this and America is great again. That was in January. By the end of February, the world shut down. Economy goes sour. This goes sour. Where people are dying, the health professionals don't know what's going on. 
But all of the pomp and all of the circumstance and all the greatness, all the might, nothing compared to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. So we would think that the world would have got the message. And therefore, after everything turned around, you know, we could just go back to being, maybe we'll be a humble nation. We'll be a humble universe. We'll start realizing that there's a Rebbeinu Sha'ilam. He gave us a very big warning. It's a little bit frightening, actually. HaKadosh Baruch Hu gave a very big warning to the world that they must humble themselves before the master of the universe. And for those months that the world was shut down, I really do believe that people were humbling themselves. How do I know? Because I, I never had so many people in a class before than the, than the days of, of, uh, of COVID. Everybody was looking for meaning and for reasoning and understanding and chizuk and everything. <clears throat> there were Zoom classes going on across the world, across the world. Hundreds and thousands of people were learning and learning and learning to be able to maintain their sanity, to understand, try to put things in perspective. But then COVID ends, and we start crawling out of the, the rat hole that we were in, and suddenly the world is just going right back to where it was with a vengeance. It's worse than it was before COVID. The fighting and the arguments and the gaiva and everything that goes on in the world today, it's worse than it was pre-COVID. How could that be? Didn't we go through an experience that should have brought us to our knees and humbled us in front of HaKadosh Baruch Hu? As long as Hashem is revealed, then yes, you know what? Then we will be humble. But once that we believe, oh, see, we made the vaccine, boom. Man can take care of things. We learned all the techniques in the hospitals, how to stop people from dying. See, we can take care of things. The economy is coming back again. Man can, in, can invest himself in economy and finances and the like. Schools are back, and this is back, and the planes are flying, and all the different things. We took care of it. We took care of everything. So we push HaKadosh Baruch out of the picture once again, and we're stuck. Now we're stuck back in this world where man is just promoting themselves, and HaKadosh Baruch is once again, he's hidden. And David HaMelech is asking over HaKadosh Baruch as long as we live in such a world where the Rebbe Yishlam is hidden as he could be, and man thinks that he's responsible for his destiny and making things the way that it is, then nobody is really under, this, under the same umbrella and we're not on the same page. And therefore, you'll see fighting in this country, in that country over there, in Eretz Israel, in China, in Iran. In Iran, they're killing people because they say something bad about the government. They just lynch them and they kill them. Nachman al What kind of a way is that to live? In, in Eretz Israel, anybody who watched any, even just saw one picture, protest people with such hatred in their minds can't stand each other. What's going on? This is Klai Yisrael. These brothers and sisters, it's not the way they treat each other. In China, in Taiwan, in Korea, in all the different places, third world countries. It's, it's wild what is going on right now. But that's because man, once again, thinks that we're the pinnacle of creation. We forget there's a Rebbein Yishayim. So we're asking, in this tefillah over here, <clears throat> in this tehillim, that HaKadosh Baruch Hu, you've got to make a nace for us. You have to make a miracle. And the miracle that we're asking for is, reveal yourself in such a way with the coming of Mashiach Tzidkenu, that the world reaches a place of perfection and truth. And once that we get into that realm, so then everybody will have to once again agree and see that you, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, you're the ultimate, the master of this universe, and we are all trying to live a life that is under the, under the rulership of Hashem. If we don't have that, then the world, unfortunately, will continue to look like it looks. And as we mentioned, if Hashem sent us such a severe warning of a COVID, and then afterwards we don't get the message, when, we're not going to open our mouths and invite the Satan in to the world. But it's something to think about. When HaKadosh Baruch Hu rebukes, the purpose of rebuke is to wake us up so that we should change our ways. If at the end of the day, nobody changed their ways really or with concerted efforts and the world just snaps back to where it was before, I don't think that's a very good sign in the, in to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. That means that maybe we didn't get the message well enough and who knows, if he could do that, God forbid, what HaKadosh Baruch Hu can end up doing. The Rav, Rav, Rav Avigda Miller Zatzal writes that if you follow the progression of history, for Klal Yisrael, 
before the Shoah, before the Holocaust came, he says, you will see that there was a 500 year buildup that carried us to the front doorsteps of the gas chambers of Rahman al And he says, throughout those 500 years, HaKadosh Baruch Hu warned, and he warned, and he warned, and he warned, and he brought troubles, and he brought suffering, and he brought difficulties. Everything was a warning. Klau Yisrael, do tshuva. Klau Yisrael, get your act together. Klau Yisrael, change your ways. And he gets to a point where the Jewish people just don't get the message. And Rahman al comes such a devastating part of the history of our nation, like nothing that was ever seen before up until that point. So Hashem has certainly been warning and now we see, I don't want to be frightening over here, but we see anti-Semitism is rising at rates that nobody has ever remembered since before World War II. That's the truth. If you follow history right now, anti-Semitism, the numbers, because the world can track the numbers better now than they ever did before, the numbers, the percentage of anti-Semitic acts and violence and remarks and the things on the internet. My wife said that she wanted to run a test of just how one-sided the news is. So she Googled the other day the war in Israel. She wanted to see what is, it, what, is the, what is the message that is being given over. If you would go online and you would see what it says. She said every single article, everyone was talking about how uh, evil the Jewish people are, that they are sending bombs and missiles to the innocent Palestinians. And everything was that we are wrong and they are right. And that's normal. And that means that any kid who goes on his phone, on his Google, anybody who wants to see what's going on, this is the mess. My, my, somebody told me that in the, in the secular news, they're not even covering it. It's like not even there. They didn't even know that there's missiles flying except that there's somebody sent them a link to a Jewish thing and so they're able to see it over there. Does that make any sense? Makes no sense. But when you live in a world that is against Klal Yisrael, so then these are the things that we're going to be dealing with. Now, the hope, because we can't, we can't leave off on a negative note. That's why every Gemara, every tractate of Gemara always ends off with some positive message. Because Messiah and Bedavar you should always end with something that is good and something that is positive. And that's really, this is the whole bakasha, this is the whole request that David HaMelech is asking for over here. And that request is that the key to our success is in the hands of Hashem, but it also has to do with im if we will do what we are supposed to do, HaKadosh Baruch is going to respond very generously. The brachas that HaKadosh Baruch Hu wants to bring to this world, they're like right there by the doorstep. He's waiting to bring it all in. We just have to open up and unlock the, the door in order that they can, all, they can all stream in to be able to come to our, to our lives, to our world. And that is that if Klal Yisrael in fact will do what HaKadosh Baruch Hu wants us to do, and we will begin to band together as a nation, I know it's a, it's a hard thing to imagine right now, but we have to think of it in terms of that which is likely for us to band together as, which means Let's say that the Frum people in the world are the only ones who know this secret. We're the only ones who know that Claudius has the band together as one to be united. Let's just say that we're the only ones. So that means then that at least amongst ourselves, amongst our families, amongst our kahilas, amongst our schools, amongst our cities, at least in there, is an obligation for Klal Yisrael to try their best to band together as one to serve the Rebbe Yisraelim. Which means that there can't be jealousies and fightings and this and division, all the different things that go on. The silly, silly things that take place in almost every single community across the world. You know, when you hear sometimes, you hear about like a community that doesn't have any sinas chinam. There's like no hatred. Every Rav loves the other Rav, and every Shul loves the other Shul, and every person loves their neighbor, and everybody gets along, and in the schools it's always peaceful and happy, and the kids... If you'll ever find such a place like that, then you're probably reading, you know, what is it? Utop uh, uh, utopian... What is it? George Orwell was Utopian Society. You're probably reading some fiction book, because it's not true. It doesn't exist in the world of reality. 
But HaKadosh Baruch Hu, that's what he wants. And he wants that people begin making the efforts to cling together as one, as one nation. Again, we're not ready to be together with the nations of the world. We're not ready perhaps to be together with the Jews that are on, really on the fringe, that don't understand what we're talking about over here. One day, Be'ez Hashem will get there. And that's the world of Kiruv. Anybody that goes out there to be Makar of another Jew, that is what he's thinking. He's thinking to himself, I want to bring this person under the umbrella of Yadus, of Yiddish Karev Hashem. I'll leave you all with a story that just was revealed to me yesterday because it's, I, I think that it's along the lines of, of this. And I'm not saying over the story to make myself look good. I just think that it's a, I think it's an amazing thing. There's a chasana tonight. Young man is getting married tonight, Be'ez Hashem. And, and um, he spoke yesterday by his ufraf. And it's a whole, he's a Sephardi, he's a Sephardi young man, and he has become one of the most cherished members of Makor Chaim. So why is a Sephardi young man becoming a cherished member of an Ashkenazi shul? How did that happen? So at the offer of yesterday by the Kiddush, he said over how his relationship goes back to Makor Chaim. And I didn't remember everything, but it's just fascinating. And he said it goes back 13 years. He was a young boy learning in Emek. So he was probably, and at that point, he was probably, I don't know, 7th grade, 8th grade maybe. He was in Emek, and it was Rosh Chodesh Sivan, which is about six days before Shavuos. And I remember the story now. Rabbi, Fishman, Rabbi Shifman, who is the principal of Emek, called me up and he said, why don't you come Rosh Chodesh to the school? And uh, so you'll speak after Davin, you give the boys some chizuk about Shavuos coming up. And uh, you're, I'm sure you're having all night learning at Yeshua. A lot of the boys live in the Tarzan and Sino area. You can promote your learning program for the night of Shavuos. Maybe you'll get some extra guys that will come. I said, fine, sounds great. I'm, in, I'm, I'm, I'm up for that. So I went to Emek. I Davin Shach is over there. And they called me up for an aliyah. And it was Yosh Chodesh. They called me up for an aliyah. And there was a young Sardi boy that was leaning. And I look at him, nice sweet boy. You know, Emek is a little bit more than the modern background. And I'm the Haredi Jew. So I think to myself, I really want to be nice to this kid. You never know how far those words will go, what kind of an impact it's going to have on this child. So he finishes leaning, did a very nice job. And I came over to him after Dom and I said, you know, you laid so nicely. Really a pleasure to hear you laying. So this guy gets up at the Ufra of yesterday by the Kiddush. And he says, he remembers when I came to Emek 13 years ago. And he remembers how nice I was and that I actually went out of my way to come over and tell him what a nice job he did leaning. Now I know, I told him, I'm sure that the reason I did was because I wanted to make an impression on you that who knows, down the road, maybe we'll come and our paths will cross again. Maybe you'll think that, you know, yeshiva guys are, are good, nice people. Maybe you want to go to yeshiva. In the end, he graduated Emek. He ended up going to Valley Torah. From Valley Torah, he went off to an Ashkenazi yeshiva in Eretz Yisrael, Medrash Shmuel. He said that, I believe, I think maybe two years he was there. Starked out, as they say, became, you know, really serious about his Yiddishkeit, about his learning, about his davening and everything. Came back to America afterwards, got a job working in Valley Torah, and he said he was working in Valley Torah, and he was davening Shachris and Mincha in Valley Torah. And then he would come home in the late afternoon, and he didn't know wherever all the... He wasn't going always for Minyan at night, and he said that, like, one day he thought to himself, you know... I'm not, I learned in yeshiva. I'm, I'm a regular from guy. Why am I davening marv in my house almost every single night? What am I doing? So he said, I really, I have to go start davening marv with a minion. So at the time, Rabbi Silberger's son-in-law was living here in Tarzana, and it was part of our shul, and they worked together in Valley Torah together. So he asked him, he said, uh, Dov, uh, I forget, his, uh, his name is, of whatever his name, yeah? So he said, tell me, he said, what time did they daven marv at, at Makar Chaim? 
He told them, they dive in this time. So he pops in for a mar one night. Davin's one night, another night, another night. And he starts coming like regular. So it's coming on a regular basis to Davin at night. Then he says, you know, what time is Shachris over there? And he starts coming to Shachris. This Friday kid comes to the Shachris with the Ashkenazim. And then he said, COVID hit. And everything got shut down. After COVID was over, he starts coming back. And, he, and uh, my son, Ari Leib, who had lived here for like five years, was leaving. And he was going off to yeshiva, and we didn't have a balkar, we didn't have something to lane the Torah. So we have a few people in the shul that are not a lane. And uh, Jonathan is an expert balkar. He, he lanes uh, Sfardi, not an Ashkenazi, but an expert, because he lanes other places. So I came over to him one day and said, I heard that you're such a good balkar. Would you mind laning for us a little bit? And that was the beginning of like four months before we got a regular balkar that he was coming every single Shabbos, helping out with the laning. And one thing led to another, and we became very close. I ended up teaching the chasen classes to get him ready for the chasana. And he became like a Ben Bias. He was at our house, I wouldn't say every week for Shabbos, but almost every other week he was in our house for Shabbos. And tonight, Bez Hashem, he's going to get married. And our whole connection is because we have to welcome all Jews in. And we have to be under the same umbrella. And that's what David Melch is saying over here. We We need that more than anything. So if Hashem is delaying the coming of Mashiach, then we have to do our part. And our part is to try to unite ourselves and align ourselves together. And if we do that, Be'ezras Hashem, if we will do that, then there is no reason why HaKadosh Baruch Hu will not make things better. There's no reason why HaKadosh Baruch Hu will not finally make the Geula come. Because he wants to reveal himself, he wants to bring the brachas, he wants everybody to serve him together as one. And if, he, if we will do our part, as Hashem, which we can, we have the yichalis, the abilities to do it, then im, if we will do bechukai saitilech, we'll go in the ways of Hashem, then HaKadosh Baruch says, I will reward you. And I will, re, I will bring you the greatest reward of all. And that is the coming of Mashiach Sitkeinu, bimheira leyameinu.